All life depends on plants. This fact can't be overstated. Plants are able to trap energy from the sun and convert it to the food that we all depend on. They recycle water and provide clean water for us and assist in the whole cycling process of water. They recycle nutrients. They trap carbon from the atmosphere. They even provide us all the food that we need, either directly or indirectly. And even one in four of the medicines that's currently used in hospitals comes from plants. So the work of the Royal Botanic Gardens Q as the global resource in plant and fungal knowledge to try and conserve plants cannot be overstated in terms of its importance, its timing, and its relevance. But conservation is not as simple as you think. It's not a case of putting a fence around a whole bunch of plants and saying, problem solved. We need information and knowledge to make conservation decisions appropriately and relevantly to different circumstances. But the first thing we need to do is know what we've got. We need an inventory of the plants, because if we don't know what we've got, how do we know what we've lost? As climate changes, as land use changes, we need to make these decisions intelligently, supported by plant sciences, which Q does. It's also supported by unparalleled and unrivaled collections. One particularly important one is the Millennium Seed Bank, which houses 25% of all known species of plants as living seeds. This is a billion seeds, all, all stored at the, at the Millennium Seed Bank in Sussex. But the collection that most of you will enjoy without realizing it, and it's the one that I use the most, is the living collections. Q has 30,000 different species of plants growing in this little corner of southwest London, making Kew possibly the most biodiverse rich place on the planet. So where do I fit? Well, I first of all need to tell you another very important fact about plants. It may seem fairly obvious to you, but plants can't move. Shock horror. Yes, I know this seems like a pretty obvious thing to, stay, to state, but the consequences of this are quite important for plants. It means they have to defend themselves right where they stand. My preferred form of defense is to run away. But plants can, of course, do this. And, of course, you may have encountered many plant defenses, bramble thorns, rose thorns, even stinging nettles. But actually, most of the most important pests for plants are actually much smaller than us. They're insects, they're diseases. And to combat these, plants use chemical weapons. And I'm particularly interested in the diversity and biological activities of these chemicals. You can see one up behind me at the moment. If it just looks like a jumbled mass of complication, that's exactly the message I'm trying to convey. Plants are extraordinary chemists. They make chemicals that we can't hope to make. And in fact, many of the chemicals that we still use in medicine, we still need to draw from plants because we can't synthesize them through an economically viable process. This particular chemical is so f such a strong feeding deterrent to locusts. In a locust swarm, this tree, the neem tree, will survive. But the interesting thing about these chemicals is they always end up in the nectar as well. So pollinators have to deal with them, and that's the bit that I'm interested in and going to talk to you about today. As most of you will know, pollination is the process by which the male gamete, the pollen grain, is transferred to another flower, from the same species to fertilize the embryo and make a seed for the next generation. And of course, because plants can't move, this is also a problem. So they employ the services of either the wind, very inefficient, or they employ the services of insects. And of course, these are adaptive processes that have evolved over millions of years. And you can see a fantastic example of this in front of you. The beautiful geometry of this association where we've got a, a lovely hawk moth feeding on a plectranthus flower, and the stamens at the end of the corolla tickling the hairy chin of this moth depositing the pollen so that when it visits another flower of the same species, it deposits that pollen in just the right place. But what's to say this, this pollinator won't actually visit another flower? And then that pollen is wasted. So plants in a very competitive world have to use all the resources available to them to make sure this process is as effective and optimized as possible. And that's where these chemicals come in. And the example I'm going to talk to you about is rhododendron. Now, we know rhododendron contains toxins. We've known about it for thousands of years, in fact. Even the Romans found out about it, although they learned the hard way. Pompey the Great, when he was invading Asia Minor in about 66 BCE, encountered a whole bunch of honeycombs laid along the path as they were entering 
as they were entering the country. Little did they know that these had been laid as a trap by Mithridates VI of Pontus, who was leading the land which Pompey the Great was trying to invade. And the troops couldn't resist, so they consumed this toxic, this toxic honey, and it put them all in a stupor. And that night, Mithridates VI, with all his army, came in and slaughtered them in his beds. So toxic nectar used as a chemical weapon of war. That's a little bit of a surprise. But of course, the thing I'm mostly interested in is what do the, what do the insects that pollinate these plants do about this? And what effect does it have on them? Well, we found some very interesting results recently. We fed the nectar from toxic rhododendrons to honeybees, and it kills them in a few hours. And what on earth would a plant want to do that? This is nectar. This is the, the floral reward for visiting, but it's killing its pollinators. We also find that it kills other species of insects or has toxic effects on other wild species. But there's one group of insects, bumblebees, that seem to be unaffected. And what we think is that this is a filter mechanism. The plant is using these toxic chemicals to filter out all the inefficient pollinators so that just a small group of pollinators visit this plant. And if you've got just a few pollinators, then that nectar's conserved for those pollinators and they specialize on you. So you're optimizing the transfer of your male gamete to your female so that you're optimizing your success in a highly competitive world. So a very fascinating way Plants are using chemicals to optimize pollination. But of course, rhododendron is a very important invasive species in the British Isles. So what are the consequences for our wild pollinators? Well, at the moment, we don't know, but I can hazard a guess. If you've ever seen a landscape dominated by rhododendron, you can be pretty sure there's not going to be very much else there apart from bumblebees. So great for bumblebees, not very good for diversity. But there's another chemical that has an even more amazing effect, and it's a drug and it's possibly a drug that you've all just taken. But to understand the effects of this drug, we have to understand another thing about pollinators. And that is that pollinators have memory. It may come as a bit of a surprise to you, but they're able to remember learned cues or traits associated with good food reward. So if a bee knows a certain color flower is providing it a good reward, it will remember that cue or that trait and will return to it. So they use color, they use shape, and importantly, they use odor the smell of the plants as a way to recall these good sources of food. You may wonder how we know that these insects have memory. Well, we have a little experiment, and I'm going to show you it. And I, I have to tell you that all the animals in these videos are looked after in the best possible way, and they're all released free afterwards. So don't get too upset about this, but I'm just about to show you a tethered bee and during this experiment, my colleague Jerry Wright at Newcastle is providing this animal with an artificial nectar. And at the same time, she's blowing a little plume of flower odor across the antennae of this insect. So that this insect is learning to associate that smell with that source of food. And we know it's remembered it because we can do another experiment. And in the next slide, you'll see us providing just the odor, and the odor comes when the red square comes. And this is after a few learning experiences it's expecting to be fed because it can smell the odors associated with that food. It sticks its tongue out, waiting to be fed. This is the proboscis extension response. And so we can show that this animal has remembered that learned floral cue. And the reason we need to know this and why this is important is because it helps us understand how plants use plant chemicals to drug bees to be better pollinators. And we know this and have shown it now from caffeine. Caffeine is a surprising addition to the suite of chemicals in nectar because it is primarily in plants to defend it. So you get lots of it in coffee beans because it protects it from weevils. You get lots of it in young tea leaves because it protects those young leaves from herbivores. So why would it end up in the nectar? Well, it's in the nectar of coffee, citrus, many other species, at concentrations that the bees can't taste. So it has a pharmacological effect on them without them knowing. And that pharmacological effect is it improves their memory for learned floral cues. And in fact, bees that are feeding on caffeinated nectar are three times more likely to remember a learned cue associated with food than bees that are not fed on caffeine. So why would this be a useful tool? Well, for plants, it means they have more visitors because bees are more likely to remember 
the traits associated with that source of food than they are the other competitors in this hugely competitive world. But some recent work that's published has shown also that not only do more pollinators go for that source of caffeinated nectar, but they then go and recruit more nest mates. So this caffeine is actually drugging bees to be more efficient pollinators and make the whole pollination process more effective. So we're interested in how we can use this knowledge and technology. But before I tell you about that, I want to emphasize something else, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this. Pollinators are in decline. It's a global problem. They're under pressure from a whole manner of different stresses. You've probably heard mostly about the pesticide issues, but of course there's land use change, there's climate change, exotic species like rhododendron taking over landscapes, and nu the nutritional in, um, inefficiencies of landscapes dominated by single species of crops, for example. And in some parts of the world it's got so bad that they have to pollinate apple trees by hand because there are no bees left. This is a photograph from China. But the UK isn't immune from this either. And we have evidence in our own food production systems that we have inefficient pollination service from our own landscapes. The picture on the, the left here shows a strawberry fruit that's produced when it's been inadequately pollinated by pollinators. And this is because there are no or inefficient pollinators in the field margins, the wild pollinators that should be doing this job for our farmers. The numbers of these pollinators are just simply too low. And so what farmers do, or one of the strategies they do, is they buy in box loads of bumblebees, literally box loads of bumblebees, each containing perhaps a, a nest of 100 bees. They maybe last four to six weeks. And they put these on the farmland and hope that the bees will go out and forage on the crop that they want pollinated. And of course, these are expensive. They might bring in diseases, which might affect the other wild pollinators in the field margins that are already depleted. And actually, they might forage on the, fo on the food in the field margins that the wild pollinators need. So what we're trying to do, and we're working on this right now, is develop a technology where we're going to incorporate a small amount of caffeinated nectar as as alongside an artificial odor of strawberry flowers so that when the bees are in transit, they're already learning to associate good food rewards with the smell of the raspberries or the strawberries, so that when they arrive on the farm and the little doors opened and the bees go out foraging, they're already focused on strawberries. And we've got some good results, but it's not all sewn up yet, but hopefully at another point in time I'll be able to give you more information on, these, uh, on this piece of work. But of course, this is just a sticking plaster. What we really need is to restore our ecosystems so that they support the pollination and other ecosystem services that our field margins and our environment should be providing. We need diverse landscapes that support diverse fauna and flora. And it's that diversity that builds resilience into those ecosystems. Diversity means resilience. You can't rely on single functional groups in these ecosystems, because if that individual is gone, then you've lost all that function within your ecosystem. So we need a strong emphasis on diversity and restoration of our ecosystems. And this is particularly important in the case of supporting pollinators. Pollinators are hugely important. It can't be underestimated how important pollinators are. In terms of their value to agriculture, Globally, they're worth about $350 billion. In the UK alone, they're estimated to contribute about a billion dollars to farming. And these are, are just the financial values. There are, of course, non-market values that pollinators provide by supporting all our ecosystems. So it's very important that we support pollinators. You may think we can survive with honeybees. Well, we can't because honeybees only provide about 10% of the pollination of the pollination in farming in the UK at the moment. We rely much more on the wild pollinators, but they're depleting and they are reducing in diversity in about half of the UK landscapes. So it's very important that we support all the wild pollinators. We have something in the region of 250 species of bees in the United Kingdom, all of which could contribute importantly to food production. So at the beginning of this talk, 
I said that all life depends on plants. But over the course of my working life, I've realized that actually plants really depend on pollinators. So perhaps we can rephrase this and say, all life depends on pollinators. So let's look after the pollinators and let the pollinators look after us. Thank you very much.